So we're going to talk about something that both of us are currently deeply immersed in. And um, fascinated myself. I think it's amazing. Maybe more it. important than fascinated, it's working. Oh, also practical, <laughs> functional, and effective. Let's talk about nervous system regulation. Right. And yeah. specifically in the context of non-monogamy, of being really creative about how your relationships go. When people come to me and work about work on the whole topic of non-monogamy, one of the things that happens is you have to figure out how to regulate their nervous system. Because your know, feelings happen and we respond to things. And this was something that it, it's it feels like a new thought. And I don't know if it is, because so many thoughts I've had aren't new. But anyway. Um, the idea that my body can respond to something that that my mind isn't is like isn't down with at all, doesn't agree with, doesn't even understand that it's happening. And so there I am reacting to a moment, and physically I'm reacting one way, and emotionally and intellectually I'm trying to react another way. Yeah, that happens a lot today. A lot. <laughs> earlier today, possibly <laughs> okay. in a couple minutes. Who knows? You yeah, who knows? Okay. I think that you just summed it up pretty clearly, though. It's when we're talking about nervous system regulation and really understanding, um, as Elizabeth Kristoff says, like having the owner's manual to your own nervous yeah. system, yeah. right? Um, when we're talking about that, I think the reason it's so important is because, in fact, your body doesn't have a, any contract with your prefrontal cortex to <laughs> uh, to just yeah. be like in line with what it thinks is a good idea. It's not beholden to that. It doesn't nope. care. It gives zero uh, bucks. It's okay. I, I see you. I see you've done a thing there. <laughs> and so, so in the context of non-monogamy, you and I both, um, we went the long way around to find nervous system regulation as a tool. Yeah. We took the long boat. I would not recommend this path. Um, we both tried to use logic, rationality. <laughs> um, Spectacularly ineffective for me. I for think sure. it's for me too, though, because what we're talking about when we say non-monogamy is, one, swimming against the, the, the typical tide, right? It, it puts you in this position to be moving in a direction that most of your peers probably aren't right to be put to be going against the grain of what you were taught what you know and what's expected of you and so it is inherently for almost all of us going to put us in the position of becoming dysregulated at times right because our bodies our ourselves were trained by Conditions. living in this monogamous uh landscape to respond in a particular way to not doing what everybody else is doing. Right. And why do we do? Why do humans do what everybody else is doing? Why do we do that? I mean, community, connection, safety. Which, what's the one question your limbic system is always trying to answer? Am I safe? Right. So if if you're, you're the older part of your brain is always trying to answer the question, am I safe? And safety is gained through connection because we're not just because we're social creatures but because as infants we are dependent on each other and as we grow and we face challenges we remain dependent on each other right well it stands to reason and it makes perfect sense then that when you and i were first really trying consciously to build uh, our non-monogamy into something that was central to our lives not just a little bit not just like playing a little bit here and there right. but something central to our lives our bodies freaked the fuck out oh, all the time really yep yeah i mean all weeks on end i think i can say Months? without exaggeration yeah. at least weeks on end of being dysregulated all the time but i didn't have that word yeah we did not uh, not at all so i didn't have flash back to 2010 uh -huh. we did not have this word is. For us, I mean, I knew the word, but I thought of it in the context of people who were um, really deeply struggling with their mental health and were 
um, like acting out in public places. I would think about it like that. Like uh, you see somebody at the grocery store having uh, like what amounts to, you know, a breakdown of their ability to behave in a way that we typically expect people to behave in public. But we were, we were just as dysregulated as our local friendly, um, uncomfortable man at the grocery store. Yep. And we didn't have that word. No. And that made it quadruply difficult to deal with what was happening in our household. And for us, this was messy. It was so messy because we were dealing with, so now we have dysregulated adults and dysregulated children because yeah. now they're keying they off, of, keying us. off of us. And on top of that, we were convinced that we were all fine because our our prefrontal cortex, yeah, <laughs> right? As though the prefrontal cortex was, could override all the signals I was getting from my body that I wasn't safe and I needed to take action. And there, that's the thing. It's not just that I was dysregulated. My body's trying to nudge me to do something in the body. And some of that nudging to do... What what was your go-to move? How did you <laughs> run away? Yeah. Run away. Perhaps it would help if I ran away more. Right. So yeah. and mine move toward move toward. Go fix it all. Mm -hmm. So I move into um a combination of things, but one of the moves, and I did not rec recognize this for a long time. One of my go-to moves is to fawn, to try to move very close and make sure that everyone's needs are taken care of. And I did not recognize this about myself because I don't consider myself a people pleaser because the people around me do not often seem pleased. <laughs> uh, and that's true. Uh, but also because, because my fawning was limited to certain circumstances. I wasn't just people pleasing all you over the place. You're right. You were running around it was appeasing everybody. It was strategic. It was strategic. Yeah. Right. And so what we're describing right now is what happens when you are responding to threat. Yeah. And the threats that we were responding to in our early non-monogamy are threats that I see people respond to all the time. They're really, really basic things. Um, if you're leaving the context of monogamy and you, you decide, you make the decision from your calmest, most collected state to choose another path, mm -hmm. go a different way yeah. with that. There you all are, are all regulated, feeling solid and stable. And, and you have this rational conversation. Yeah, that just makes you win sense. The I can see the pros and, and cons. You're thinking all the way through executive functions online and, and great. make the decision. And then stuff happens. Like somebody goes on a date or- Which was part of the plan right up until it happened. Right. At which point now you have stuff to deal with that wasn't part of the original plan. And I've noticed that um, none of us <laughs> is immune to this. So even if even if it's not getting dysregulated because uh, somebody's going on a date, it could just be something simple. Like I experienced a bunch of dysregulation because you and I we're, we 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 met our relational challenges differently. So even when we were doing well and we were each individually meeting the challenges of our life well, I would feel like a little off from you, and then I would feel dysregulated. And yeah. so so many things could yeah. cut us off. And all of that is to say we didn't have any skills. We had just zero skills for dealing with this. We both were relying a hundred percent on rationality and logic. And <laughs> it's not that it just didn't work. It's that it felt like it worked. And that tricked us. It felt us. like it worked. Yes, that's it. I mean, <laughs> um, it's it's a combination of things, as you said, from from a calm, regulated place, we would think and talk and plan and it seemed to all make sense and and that was when we were actually regulated and then there were the times when we thought we were regulated and weren't right and still thinking that we're totally that the 
the executive function is is controlling everything and that we are being rational and sensible and thoughtful and taking everything into account and we weren't and there's a word that came up tonight we were in a group tonight and a group of brilliant people delving into their own adventures in non-monogamy and one of them said that she identified some of her dysregulated states and her opportunities, missed opportunities. She said, yeah, I felt really righteous. Oh, And yeah. I thought this was just brilliant. This was a brilliant observation because the more righteous I feel, <laughs> the more suspicious I need to be about right. myself. Yeah. Um, because that righteousness is the invitation I could give myself to just say, hang on a second, hang on a second that righteousness for me is a clue and so when i heard when i heard somebody else notice it in themselves I was like, yeah yeah you and i were in it yesterday yeah this happened you know we we were we got into an argument and this time you noticed first you were like wait 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 let's regulate we're, we're at the beginning of a fight let's let's do what we need to to regulate our bodies to to get in in and I did, and you did, but I didn't set down my righteousness. Hmm. Yeah. So I did regulate my nervous system, but the righteousness that was was my clue, and I might have taken it earlier, um, I, 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 st I let it get in my way even after I had done the body stuff. So, so it can activate things that then persist. Yeah, it was really mm -hmm. persistent. And, yeah. you know, when, so now we've been talking about this for a, a while already, and we haven't really said, so what the hell do you do? What do you do? When practically speaking, it's all well and good to say you should be regulated and regulation will help if you're delving into non-monogamy, but what do you do? And this is the cool thing. This this is, I I love the program. Yeah, so working with Elizabeth Kristoff is yeah, so wonderful. We both decided to take this seriously because um it's the psychological impact of like of of treating non-monogamy, of treating relationship development as an opportunity for personal development. That's been great. And that's been great for well over a decade, even when it was really, really hard. But we both struggled with. But how do we systematically use these tools, use the different ways of working with an embodied self? How do we, how do, we do that systematically? Because when you're yeah. dysregulated, it's really hard yeah. to do the things that you know you need to do. And so not having, not having a clearer framework has been a real problem. Yes. And one of the very first things that... The, was the first thing that I heard when we started talking about the, the nervous system is if, if, if I'm dysregulated and somebody comes to me and I'm maybe excitable and I'm, I'm you know, anxious and, and somebody comes to me and says, calm down. Okay, let me take this dysregulated state and control the state. I'm going to try to calm myself down. That does not work. I mean, well, every a, once in a while, they're like, maybe you can do it, but it is not reliable. Okay, but from a physics perspective, what happens if you take an energized system and you put it in an, an enclosed... It gets really container. energized. Yeah, that's it. You try to contain it, and it just gets worse and worse and worse the more you try to contain it. I think it. we have a microwave then, right? Like, right, and now you get a laser. That's what you get. You get oh, a laser. Okay. A perfectly contained little bit of radiation, and now it's gotten worse. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So... Yes. And I love, so this, this satisfies me this in so many ways. So there's the physics analogy. You try to contain something with a lot of energy and it just becomes harder and harder to contain. And then from my chemical engineering point of view, the process flow of this is beautiful. So it's a process. Mm -hmm. Your nervous system, it takes stuff in and it's then inputs. there's outputs. And it gets out and it has And outputs. stuff happens in between. And if you're at the output, and you're trying to change the process, it's too late. You're at the output. Anything you do to it doesn't affect the process. You've got to go back to the input. 
Okay, and this is why the framework that we're learning at Neurosomatic Intelligence yeah is so helpful yes. in the context of non-monogamy because so frequently what I see with clients is they, they're they already at a state where they don't like the output that they're getting. The output from their nervous system, the output from their relationship yeah. agreements, yeah. the output from the way that their interactions, every conversation, they don't like how the outputs are. And so they just keep trying to change the outputs. And I get it because you and I did that. I mean, well, we spent that's what we, did. we spent a yeah. solid six years yeah. trying to change outputs before yeah. we really even stumbled into trying to change the inputs. Yeah. And now I've been slow to come to a really embodied type of psychology, but this one makes sense to me. And the reason it makes sense, the reason I've been able to adopt this more quickly is that the results are clear yeah so yep. it's... for me the very first thing i put into place was just exactly what you were describing i just remembered that if i don't like the outputs that i'm getting stop trying to fix the output and try fiddling with the inputs yes and I do this in when I'm negotiating with people and I'm helping them negotiate their relationship agreements. We we always do this. We go back to the beginning yep. and I ask them to go deeply into their own sense of what do you want? What do you need? What do you desire? And we explore there for a while. And then we start talking about guiding principles, like what matters to you? What are your values? And then after we've established that, then we start talking about the process. How do you, okay, okay, now yeah. how do we enact it? Yep. What do we do? What are the rules of the road? And what are we, how are we going to act? But it's so frequent that I, that I see people do what we did early yeah. on, which is just jump right to the end of that and say, I want a relationship that looks like this. As if that's as if you're just gonna, yeah, just we gotta start at the beginning. And the beginning yeah. is embodied, it is delving deeply into what it feels like to be in my body. Yours, not mine. You need to delve into what yours feels like, and I need to delve into what mine feels like because my inputs that work for you won't work for me. Right. They won't get me the result I'm looking for. They'll do something. And so this is really practical stuff. The other Very thing practical. that I have enjoyed about this, and I know you have too, is it's a little bit more like hygiene. Um, it's yeah. a little bit more like brushing teeth. Yep. So I enjoy meditation. Um, it took me a while to really like work into a practice of it. And I, you know, I have I have moved into and out of deep meditative practices over the course of the last 20, 20 plus years, longer than that, even I've Wow. Yeah. Since I was a teenager. So, but frequently I find myself in periods of time where it's hard to maintain a deep connection to these longer practices. You know, like mm -hmm. I spent so long raising little children and homeschooling them. And, you know, I, there were just so many times where it, it was hard to prioritize that part of my beingness as important as I knew it was. And I'm not denying its importance, and I'm never going to set down my 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 continued coming back to the mat and doing that kind of work. But this is practical because it's fast. That's yeah. The, I appreciate that. One of the things that makes it practical is we're talking about less than a minute to help to your do body a thing return to that, a state mm -hmm. of. And you might want to do a few of them, but it's easy because they're short. Right. So. When we're talking about nervous system regulation, then what we are talking about is helping people understand the kind of stimulation their nervous system wants in order to feel able to cope with what's going on in their life. Yeah. And so like one of the one of the neurosomatic drills that works really, really well for me, is a really simple thing that you do. Um, it's just it's a it's a gaze stabilization thing. Um, I, I look at my thumbnail at a very specific spot. I look off into the distance and I I allow my gaze to come into focus 
on my thumbnail and then further away. And it, we can get into the specifics of it, but the point is, it's really simple. I do this for about 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Yep. And I find it, well, to be perfectly honest, really damn upsetting how uh, well, different I want to change it now, right? Right. And how much more capable I feel of looking at you and assuming goodwill. Mm. When I take that 30 seconds, or sometimes I'll stack that with a couple of other drills. So maybe I take a minute and a half, two minutes when we are right at the edge of what could turn into an argument. And now I'm able to remember that from your perspective, you, it makes you, what you're talking about makes sense. <laughs> there are so many times I that in the middle of a fight, one of us or both of us have agreed we, we're going to like walk away for a while. And then we'll come back and see what happens. That's usually you. And it's usually you me. Usually yeah. instigate I'm that. usually I'm usually the one who's like, okay, I'm gonna go away and come work. back. And the idea was sound, but I never had any idea what to do when I went away. It's like I know I need to disengage so that things can change and we can get back together in a different way. And I was right, but I had no idea what to do while I was out there. Right. I would try some things just randomly, and some of them maybe even work sometimes, but it was hit or miss. Well, this stuff. Right. So one of the things that I know you tried um, is you write. Yeah. You go and you you go away and you journal, but um, you've been incredibly vulnerable with me and have shared some of what you've written. And I love you. No, I love you so, so much. This is hard. You are so cruel to yourself. Oh, that in those writings, not mm -hmm. all the time. Sometimes you're just observing and you're just writing your feelings, but, and you don't share them all the time. But I remember the first time you shared with me what you had written as a way to show me that you were, yet yeah, you, this was a time when you had disengaged. You did not tell me when you'd be back. It felt very much like an abandonment to me. And when I shared that with you, you were like, wait, 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 I was doing something. And I, I want to share this with you. And it broke my heart because the thing you were away doing was beating the shit out of yourself so that you i don't even know so what i like well i, yeah. I know that you <laughs> i know that your intention was to come back to me and to show me that you you were taking this yucky situation and you were taking it seriously but the way that you were speaking to yourself, mm -hmm. I know that voice. And I know that, and I and and I know that that is so not the whole you. It, it it's like looking into your authority complexes and and seeing how how very much there is. A wounded child inside of you, yeah, yeah. and how much you wanted to please me, and when you felt like you had failed me, or that our relationship wasn't working, how deeply unsafe you felt. There were so many in, in what you're talking about. There were so many threat responses. There was fight, flight, fawn. They were all there. I got freeze, flop, well, probably in there too. Too is like. What you're describing is everything all together. Yeah. And when I think back to especially those early times when when you would go away and and eventually we would come back together and we would find regulation so frequently, how we found regulation was through sex. Yes. Yeah. I don't find that surprising at all now. Now, when I when I when I think about the neurology that I understand, when I think about what I know about what my body responds to, I'm like, huh, funny uh, that we found our way back, not just through um, the fun that sex is, but actually through um, syncing up our breathing, right. syncing up our heartbeats, mm -hmm. um, allowing ourselves to come into each other's gaze and be witnessed, but also releasing oxytocin. 
right. engaging the ventral striatum and like <laughs> allowing uh, it makes sense and it's like intuitively each of us knew that one of the pathways back was actually to go directly to this physical embodied co-regulation yeah it's a lot of inputs it's a lot of inputs Sense. but the thing is we we would we would frequently enter into it in such a clumsy manner mm -hmm. that yeah it it was also fraught it was fraught yeah. with so much emotionality we asked the sex to hold all of this emotionality that we had it was it it, it made it so that sometimes that particular kind of physical intimacy became yeah it's therapeutic but i mean sometimes you just don't want to go to therapy and you just want to fuck that's right <laughs> yeah you know it became associated with repair and work and um the the associations of the original um rift all of it hey you want to have sex Ooh, yes absolutely can we do can we have sex without having a fight? And that's what we would say to each other. Like, do you remember how to just have yeah. sex? And I, because I have dated quite a lot more, sometimes I would just turn to another partner. Right. And like, they're... well, this is easy. This isn't going to be that messy, more difficult kind. All of this. <laughs> it's tricky being human. It is. So all of this is to say, I'm really grateful for having now a clearer framework Mm -hmm, of yeah. moves to make on a both like toothbrushing sort of level like every day now when I wake yeah. up I spend three or four minutes doing a few drills that I know work for my body to try to you know get myself here into my body but also before we're going to have hard conversations we're practicing these it sets the stage yeah. for a positive outcome we're also um stopping each other and it's it's been interesting to learn how to call time out and not yeah. leave. Yep. To call time out and say, um, let's just regulate. And I think most interestingly for me is while I really appreciate co-regulation, I really, really do, we have relied on that so much. Right. Yeah. And I've been really wanting to build up the skills of regulation in my body on my own. And this is giving me a framework to do that so that I can co-regulate with you, but I don't have to use your physical yeah. embodiment, which also makes me safer with other partners. I've had a lot of other partners. I mean, just over the last couple of years now, I've had quite a few other partners and almost none of them have been particularly um, safe for me to engage with at that sort of emotional level. So. I need the tools need for myself. The tools. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I really recognized all the reasons why. But now that we have them and we're putting them into practice and I'm starting to use them more specifically with my clients, I'm noticing that they're so easy and straightforward that um, the biggest trouble, the biggest struggle I'm having is not feeling like this shouldn't work. This is too easy. Oh, yeah. This is that too is, easy. That's a real, a real concern. I mean, the the last time we had a fight, I'm like, okay, I'm going to regulate. I had zero expectation that it was going to do anything. Right. And while doing it, I still had zero expectation that it was going to do anything. Yep. And then I stopped and I looked at you. And I realized that I could, I was thinking different than I was before. Right. It's just the whole situation seemed different. Right. Than sad. This makes sense. The things I can really specifically, if you just think about like, if you have a, if you have a flood of hormonal response, right? Like if you, if you have an adrenal flood yeah. and then you take an action that tells your body, oh, it's okay. It's okay. We can actually come back into regulation. Great. Well, that's that's what your body's designed to do. So if if you're threatened, 
and then you notice that the threat was just a kitten, it chills down. It not only chills out, but it's like, yeah, let's play with a kitten, right? Your body can learn to do this. And that's what I have loved about this tool is yeah. that it can be yeah. quick because your body's ideal state isn't calm and settled all the time. And in fact, both all of us time? No. experience a lot of this, a lot of pressure to be calm, yeah. to be calm and the same all the time. In previous relationships, we have both been been really stuck with people who wanted everything to be calm all the time. That's not what we're looking for either. We're looking for dynamic and fluid and, and able to respond to threat and then return to homeostasis. So that fluid ability to modulate yeah no wonder it feels like a magic trick it does. after years and of being told i was bad because i didn't just stay the same and mm -hmm. stable and steady and exact and never have emotions to to recognize that yeah i have these big emotional waves and i can i can bring myself back into a regulated state with things i can do in myself in my own system yeah you can so you i can affect like, yourself and to remind myself that it is not a magic trick. It's literally just working with the body as it exists. Yeah. And as long as I remember that, <laughs> I can let it be easy. I can let it be easy. Because you just named, we had this, we had a, a run-in yesterday that could have turned into a half day spike. And instead it was, ah, I don't know. Five minutes, yeah, seven minutes. It was, it was total, really fast. It total. Was, and it never yeah. reached it never reached a threshold where there was any kind of um threat to our beingness. Right. Nope. But it almost did. Because I remember I reached over to close the door behind me. Mm -hmm. And if I close the door, it's because I clearly don't want any of the children to be affected by the energy we're bringing. I closed the door and you said, hold on. And, you know, I mean, it was just, it was so soon after that. And it's not that, it's not that we didn't still have stuff to talk about and stuff to work oh, out. Oh, there was plenty. I still disagreed yeah, with what was the, going the, on. The, um, the facts stayed the same, but our ability to manage and work with those facts improved. Yeah. And I think, I just noticed this, neither one of us really believed the fight was over. Nope. We were still, like you said, it was probably yeah. five to seven minutes and we resolved it. Like we 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 looked at it, we acknowledged everything that had happened, we looked at it from a bunch of angles, and, and we, we moved on. Like we came from it and and we moved on. But for the like you said, it could have been a half day. So for the rest of the half day, both of us were like right. <laughs> Sus. As the children on, would say. Are you fighting with me? Because I don't think I'm fighting with you. Right. So and we won. But there's there's another part of this is learning to trust that you're doing your work and I'm doing mine. This is going to be another whole layer of our yeah. relationship because mm -hmm. um, over the course of our 13 years of intimate relationship and over the course of our friendship before that, um, it's been my role to do the emotional yeah. labor. Mm -hmm. That has primarily been my role. And um, I have led and you have, you have followed willingly and beautifully, but you have but followed. followed. Yeah. And this time you've been taking responsibility for yourself. Pretty weird, huh? <laughs> well, I'm definitely having to, um, uh, come to terms with the reality that you won't need me to figure out your emotional state, explain it to you, and then help you through it. And this, um, it reminds me of when you first realized that I didn't need you to earn money anymore because I, yep. like, I have my own career. And you were like, okay, I thought I was an evolved uh, man who'd done my work on feminism. And then it turns out that actually this was part of, oh no. Yeah. Right? It's, it's really something. It turns out that like up to and including today, I can feel this, this part of me, as we are all multiple, um, that doesn't want you to be able to navigate your own emotionality. 
there's part of me that doesn't want you to um, self-regulate, that wants you to come to me for your co-regulation. Yeah. Those are enmeshed parts. Those are the enmeshed parts. And we both and learned I, that. We both learned it, and I really like having those parts out where I can see them, where I can talk to them, and they can talk to me. Yeah, one of my enmeshed parts here, um, she is deeply concerned with how everyone feels <clears throat> and she imagines that she is the only one who can figure out the solution mm -hmm. to the problems she's also 14 years old and probably should go on a vacation um <laughs> but she gets pretty freaked out that part mm -hmm. and i i have to give her some some room and some space and um, I mean, this is why I go to my own therapy. This is this is why is to make space for those parts that are like, oh hell no, don't let him, don't let him figure out, figure this out. Don't let him be healthy, be psychologically mature. Yeah, because here I am, this deep in the stuff with you, and and my whole world revolves around psychological individuation, and still. Yeah, I see you, girl. You're not I immune to psychology. You're just studying psychology. <laughs> Thanks. It's <laughs> true. It's true. It's, it's humbling to constantly realize that knowing something has nothing to do. <laughs> knowing it in that front part of my brain, knowing it has absolutely nothing to do with being out of its grip. Yes. Yeah, it is humbling. And yeah, maybe that's maybe that's exactly what this is for. When I think about putting nervous system regulation and just understanding the tools of it, the moves of it, the framework for it, when I think about putting that into our relationship, I think, okay, well, damn, the next 20 years is gonna be really interesting. <laughs> yeah, it is. Because I don't have any idea what it is that we can do together because i already thought we were not just powerful but also just mm -hmm. and enjoying each other but i already see the difference in and the freedom and even like more space around my heart because i'm not dependent instead i can move toward you with with true affection and enjoyment yeah, of your really otherness there's a there's a freedom yeah. in seeing you and seeing you see me as someone that you just choose not that you feel bound to by any uh i mean we we did away with the the social bindings but that then that's good but it didn't necessarily do away with all those enmeshment psychological bindings that we created ourselves yeah and I feel I like I feel those immature parts of me, those parts who are are wounded and and are they're stuck. They're sort of frozen in time. Yeah. The parts that I'm still trying to recollect and integrate, um, and will always be in the process of of integrating. I feel that I'm trying to um, rebraid <laughs> rebraid those enmeshments. I feel yeah. them like yeah. oh, but yeah. And to some extent, that's just because that's what I know. But also, it feels good to feel needed that way. Yeah. It, it just it feels does. safe and easy yep. and familiar as hell. And so I'm choosing another way. And I'm choosing it yeah. every day, over and over, all day. And I feel like. It, this feels sort of anticlimactic. Like, wait, haven't we been doing this the whole time? <laughs> but it's like exposing another whole layer of oh, because this time we moved it into into the body, but also we moved it into this sort of day to day, minute to minute conversation we're having because we both yes. actively decided I'm buying in. Mm -hmm. This is it. I am adding this. It was a lot like when I added. Um, when I added psychology as like as a as the framework of my life, like it holds this huge space in our relationship to talk about things psychologically. 
I invited Psyche in and therefore invited myself into Psyche. I invited myself into this nervous system work. And now it's here and it's present. And you decided to come along for the ride. And I'm so excited because yeah. I could do this on my own. Yeah. And it's it's like exponentially more exciting and interesting to see how it's working in our house. And that the kids are already responding to it and they don't they they don't are. even know what's yep. happening. Yeah. Like we're not really talking about it a ton with them, but I can feel how the whole house is moving and modulating more smoothly. Yep. It helps all to have a cook stove again. It's good to be able but... to eat food in our house. Yeah, that's helpful. But I really do. I mean, we have in this in the house, we have so many children. Um, all in college, all struggling with deadlines and all this, and I, I feel them. Sort of, it's like the house is breathing with us. Yes. Yeah. So I'll take that. Okay. So it's a win. It's that, a win. That's what we've come this, up with. We, it's we, a win. This is not it's a good ad. I don't think it's the only thing. I'm. I. I'm. I am here for multiplicity. I do not believe that we are only bodies either. I believe that we. Are embodied souls. Yeah, I don't believe in all ones, generally speaking. But um, I'm really excited. I'm really happy. And if if you're listening to this and thinking, well, okay, clearly I need to know about that. Um, absolutely, get in touch with us. Um, we are doing this work with people in groups. If you are on your individuation path. Um, from a non-monogamous perspective in particular, or from a creative monogamous perspective, reach out. We've got, you can, you can join us in a group. The group setting is a fantastic it place is. to learn about this, but also to be in community with other people who are committing to not just nervous system work, but negotiated clear relational agreements, figuring out how to do boundaries, not just set boundaries, and how to really engage with their whole selves. Relational individuation is, it's a whole level up. And if that's what you want for more people around you who are doing it too, uh, um, easier it's likely to be. Yeah, so please join us. Um, you can absolutely, you can reach out in a few different ways. You can reach out to Ken at ken at juliehamilton.com. Questions, or, comments, whatever you, you got. You can also go to joliequiz.com. If you're curious and thinking, well, non-monogamy has been on my radar. I That's why I'm listening to your podcast, but I don't really know whether I'm ready. Go to joliequiz.com, J-O-L-I-Q-U-I-Z. And you can just take a 10 question quiz. I made it out of my research um, in non-monogamy over the last 13 years and my heavy duty research in jealousy specifically. And at the end of it, you'll get an invitation to get my brain on your relationship and find out whether this is the right step for you. And I would love to talk to you about that. I'm really loving talking to you about all of this too. So thank just, you for showing up. And thank you. It's again. just been amazing. High fives all oh, around. Wow. I'm really excited and I'm really grateful for all of you who are listening and Take a moment for yourself now. And if you know nothing else to do to regulate, just take a few slow, deep breaths and allow yourself some grace before you go back into whatever's next for your life, for your moments right now.